green yet and everything. Everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Kellenberger, and I am not going to worry too much about this screen because I know that you just had an introduction about me. However, um, the important thing to know about me is that I'm a lifelong teacher and lifelong learner and teacher, and I just love sharing knowledge with everyone about what I've learned about SQL Server. Um, here's my agenda, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background of why I came up with this session. It's because starting with 2005, I would always put together a session talking about all the new T-SQL features of every edition. So every edition that would come out, I would have a talk. When I got to 2012, there were so many new features, and I discovered a set of of functions called windowing functions. And I just started concentrating on that. And that one session ended up being two sessions, ended up being a book, ended up being a plural site course. And if you've seen me spoken speaking in the past, you have probably seen me talk on windowing functions. That's not what this is completely about today, but I thought about how people kind of get stuck doing the same things over and over again, uh, solving problems the same way. And I get it. You're busy. You've got to solve a problem and you do it the way you know how. And when I've been out presenting on windowing functions or any of a lot of the other new functions, almost everyone in the room has never heard of them. So I thought this was a nice way to so show not not concentrating on a group of functions, but just a way to show how to solve some problems that might be similar to those that you come up with. Uh, since this is 50 minutes, I, I'm going to say the last little section that I usually talk about will be bonus. If I get to that, I'll cover it. If not, then um, I just won't worry about it today just because it is 50 minutes. All right, so we do get stuck doing what we know works, that might be something like a cursor. Uh, to me, a cursor is another tool in your toolbox. There's the rare case where that's the right answer. Maybe you have a cursor that reads a list of user accounts and does something with those accounts. That makes sense. But typically to solve a T-SQL problem, that's not the right answer. It's probably going to be slow. It's probably not going to scale, but that might be the most logical way uh, that you come up with when you're when you're trying to solve it. Um, sometimes there's things that can be solved with self joins, and you you get this really great solution, and it looks, you know, it's pretty pretty complex, and and you're really proud of yourself for doing it. But you know what? It again, it might not be a good way to solve a problem. There might be something that's much better that is available that you don't know about. Another one that's really uh, a red flag for me are scalar UDFs. A lot of places use these to reuse formulas. Uh, a lot of times these are not gonna scale. I don't know if I'll get to talking about this particular item uh, because that is in the intelligent query processing at the end, but just in case. So the first problem is called the stock market problem. Back when I was a consultant, a DBA came to me, I was working on an ETL project and the DBA came to me and said, I pull data from the stock market every night and I want to compare the closing price of one day for a stock with the closing price of another day. I think you can help me solve that query. Um, so I did. Then a few months later, 
uh, a junior consultant who I was mentoring came to me and said, hey, I pull data from the stock market every night. I have an ETL process that loads it into a table. I want to compare the closing price from one day to the closing price of the next. How do I do that? So you may think I'm making this up, but this is exactly what happened. So I'm going to show you how that problem was solved. Oh, wait, before I do it, I am going to show you what the data looks. Not quite ready to go to the, this is what, I want to show you this first. Um, so I have lots of symbols and my data is all made up. Obviously, these are real, da real dates, fake ticker symbols, fake prices. So if I have ticker symbol Z1 and I on the second date, if I want to compare these, I got to pull this earlier one forward. OK, and so on. And if I get to a new ticker symbol, I don't want to pull a value from the previous one. All right, I think I'm now ready to go to the demo. And let's see. Yep, that's it. All right, so I have created this stock history table. And I, I, my slides are available. My slides and code are available out of my GitHub. I don't have a link to that here, but I'll also send it to the organizers as well. Um, but you can create this table. So you can see that you've got all these different symbols. Um, there's almost 700,000 rows in this table. So it's going to be kind of a lot of work to compare one to another. So the first thing I might try to do to try to figure this out is do a self-join. I might say, well, I got to join the stock history table to itself based on the symbol uh, and then where the one trade date is greater than the other. Um, I might do this, but it would not work because I'm really kind of creating a Cartesian product here. I'm going to stop it. You can see that this is not working. And the problem is I'm pulling all the dates from B, not just the one date that I need. So that doesn't work at all. I could, I'm going to go ahead and run this for a few seconds because it will populate uh, my little temp table here. So I could do something like this. And I'm just going to let it run for about 10 seconds because I, I'm not going to sit here for a couple of minutes. Actually, even a couple of minutes only processed uh, over 2,000 rows, not the 700,000. OK, I'm going to stop that. Since it populates uh, one stock day, you know, one ticker day per run, I will have some data in my stock table, in my uh, temp table. And I just have 116 rows processed, but you can see that it did work. So this solution does work. And maybe it might make sense if you were going to just run the new values every night. That wouldn't take too long. You know, it might be a viable solution. But if you got to run the whole thing, forget it. It's going to take, I don't know, maybe an hour. All right. So there's an operator called apply where we can you know basically select top one so we can use that same join this outer query to the inner query join on ticker symbol where the trade date is less than the outer trade date i've got this filtered just to run a few you go ahead and run that not sure how long it will take this will work and it it ran it ran in five seconds, but I only tested four symbols, not several hundred like I've got. And it did work. So that is a possible solution, but it's still slow. So here's the best solution. There is a function called lag, and it's one of the windowing functions that was introduced in 2012. So don't worry too much about the syntax. Uh, you know, either find a recording of me talking about this out there or get my, I have a book on windowing functions. Uh, it's like Ben's gone has a book as well. 
And, and of course, there's Microsoft documentation. But basically what's going on is I'm using lag to grab a column from a previous row. I use the over clause to explain to lag how I want the data lined up and that I don't want to cross ticker symbols. And you can see that this works. And it's really fast. I ran the entire data set in nine seconds and got the right answer. I love lag. It is my absolute favorite function. And let's go back to the slides. Um, oops, I'm not. There we go. So there's also one called lead that lets you go forward in the data set. Uh, this is just some other information about it that I just kind of went over during the demo. So I'm going to go move on. And I didn't really, I guess we can say if there's time, I'll save questions for the end. Uh, the next one is an interesting problem. You may remember getting some publications like this delivered to your house on a weekly or monthly basis. Magazine subscriptions. I still get one just because I like to just kind of sit and, you know, read it when I want to get away from a computer. The subscription problem was originally from SQL Server Central, and it was part of what was called the Speed Freakery Contest. With this contest, SQL Server Central supplied a set of data, a cursor solution, and then a prize to whoever could get this to run, get the solution, get a, get a new solution to run the fastest. The cursor solution was supplied so that the contestants knew that they were getting the right answer. So here's an example of what it might look like. I've got a registration ID. I got a date that they joined, you know, started getting the subscription and also the date that they left. So for every month, I don't care when they join during the month, but for every month, how many subscriptions are current? So what you'd have to do is take the previous number of subscription, subscriptions, add how many joined that month, and subtract how many left. And you'd get an answer something like this. Okay, so I'm going to pop over to the slides again, to the uh, demo again. And let's take a look at how this works. So here's this, the original problem was from back in 2008 or nine before SQL Server 2012 came out. So what, a little bit more about the background that I forgot to say is that the Guru Solutions that the people that won the contest were, were so hard to understand that Redgate at the time, and I wasn't working for them back then, came approached me and said, can you write an article explaining this solution? So I did that. And then when 2012 came out, I said, hey, wait a minute, there's all these new functions. Maybe they will make solving this problem easier. So I went back and revisited several, several of those contests. So I did not enter the original contest, but I was able to eventually, with a lot of study and experimentation, understand the uh, solutions by the gurus and explain them. So here's the data. So one thing I will say is that for the time period, which is about 30 years, um, every month has people joining there are some months that do not have people left. And that does make a difference in the solution. So the original problem back in the late 2000s only had 10,000 rows. I had to bump this up to a million rows to make it worth it on my new lap newer laptop, okay, that's pretty beefy. And so let me just show you that, that we do have a million rows. And 
part of it is that hardware has just improved a lot over the last you know 12 years or so. So one thing that I can do is take this data and I can break it down and say, okay, here's my registrations each month, here's my unsubscribes each month, and then I can work with that. So just doing that makes the problem easier. And that's the basis of all the solutions. Okay, there's a lot of ways we could solve this. Uh, in this case, I've taken the joins and the lefts and put them in common table expressions. Then I join together. And then in the outer query, I use a correlated subquery to do my running total. It's basically a running total solution. I mean, this will work, but it does take a very, very long time to run. This is not the guru. I don't have the guru solution in here. I'm going to go ahead and stop this because it would take too long. The guru solution did something called a quirky update. Um, and if you uh, go out and queer, you know, do a search for that, you might find it. It was a very odd solution, that, but ran very fast. So here was the um, solution that was given to the contestants. And go ahead and just run that for a few seconds. I don't want to run the whole thing. I'll just run it for about 10 seconds. Oh, it actually ran fast. Isn't that crazy? Sometimes it runs fast for me and sometimes it doesn't. Depends on... I guess what else is going on on my laptop. Um, and there's the report. So even on a million rows, the cursor solution ran pretty fast. But it doesn't always. So I guess it depends. So this is the modern solution that I came up with in 2012. Again, I have got a common table expression for the new subscription a common table expression for the cancellations. I'm also using this thing called EO month. And let's go back and look at what I was doing back here. I was breaking the data apart and putting it back together uh, for the end for the first of the month because I had to normalize the date in some way because we had dates all over. We just wanted to standardize on the month. I'll talk more about this function in the next section. So let's go ahead and run that. Again, I'm, I've got my new subscriptions, my cancellations, and in the outer query, I am joining those together on the date. And I'm doing something interesting. I'm you doing the sum. Let me go ahead and run it. But I'm doing that, and it ran very quickly. I'm doing the sum of the people joined, subtracting the people left. That makes sense. And it's also followed by this thing called the over clause, which you saw in the last section. I An over clause with an order by. So I'm telling SQL Server I want a running total. And I'm also using this thing called a frame to tell SQL Server how I want these lines to roll up and how I want things to be added up or counted. Um, you can al also use this to do something like a moving average. Uh, previous to 2020, a lot of people had not heard of moving averages unless they were working with financial information, financial data. And now I see a moving average Every day for my local county health department, the moving average of positive uh, percent of positive tests. So they could be, I don't know how they're so calculating it. They could be using something like this, just changed up a bit. So that's how to solve that problem. And it to me, it's easier even than writing a cursor. I just have to understand this window, windowing function here window aggregate, I like to call it. So I'm going to go back to the slides. And again, this is new with SQL Server 2012. It will work if you don't add this frame for running regular 
running total, it will work. However, the performance could degrade if you don't do that. The next one I want to talk about, uh, kind of look at that end of month problem. Uh, and it's part of a bunch of uh, functions called the and I call, I don't know, I made it up, the easy functions. And um, some of these I think were around 2008, some of them 2012. Uh, and some of them perform well if you only have a handful of rows. Some scale pretty well. So what one of the things that I changed about that last section is that I used the function called EO month instead of splitting the data part and putting it back together. So I found, and then I found that it scaled really well. It was much better to use the EO month function than to tear the data part and put it together. Some of the other easy functions don't scale quite as well. And let's say, so one of them, uh, there's a string split where you can take a comma delimited list, let's say it's from reporting services and you're sending a comma delimited list over a, to a stored procedure and you've got to split those out. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's the XML way, which I absolutely hate because it's so hard to write. Uh, there's a way where you could create a little function and loop through looking for the commas and send back a table, or you could use string split. String split evidently doesn't scale very well. However, if you're just using it on 10, 20, 30 items, you know, it doesn't matter if it scales or not because that's just a little bit of data. So it makes things easy. Let me just go ahead and, and I feel like I'm really zipping through these because I haven't stopped for questions, but I'll stop for questions at the end. Okay, EO month. Um, I'm not going to give a demo on all of these, um, but here's some of them that I was playing around with. There's one called IIF, which is a uh, kind of kind of like a, a a case where you only have two options. And I think some of these were things that came from like either Excel or Access or other programming languages and possibly just to make it easier to convert code into T-SQL. Uh, Concat is one of my absolute favorites and I will show you a little bit about that. There's a format function where you can format dates exactly how you want. Um, I don't think that one really scales too well the string split that I mentioned, EO month, and there's several others. These are kind of the ones that I'm interested in. So if I look at, um, just to show you Concat, if you haven't heard of it, let's say, let me do something here. I am going to comment that out for a minute. If I would try to run this, I will get a bunch of nulls because there are many names that don't have a middle name. Middle name is null, so they drop out. So by using, let me get that back in here, and I'm going to forget business entity ID for just a minute. If I try to run that with this new concat function, concat takes care of the nulls for me. So that's one thing I really, really love. It takes care of the nulls for me. So I might want to do something like add uh, a space in there, something like that. Might want to do something like that. The other thing that Concat is fantastic for, I'm going to go ahead and just copy that and paste it. If I wanted to add the business entity ID, just add it in both places. Um, obviously, 
this is not going to work because I can't add business entity ID because it's an integer. So I get this conversion failed. Okay. So let me just get rid of that piece because that's not going to work. But I can do it with concat and concat will take care of my conversions for me. So that's why I really, really love it. And I did find that it, it scaled pretty well. So obviously your mileage may vary. Um, here's the breaking a date apart. If I wanna break a date apart to get the end of the month, here's a way I might do that. You know, I've got a lot, a couple date ads there, I'm casting, I'm, you know, it's really, really messy. In order to really show the difference here, I'm using a different table. Uh, this is from Adam Mechanic, you may have heard of him. Um, he has this script, he also has SP who is active, but that's what he's most famous for. But he also has this thinking big adventure table, which you can go out and download and, and run. So I like to use his tables often just to, when I'm working with performance, just because there's quite a few rows. And th this case, I created a smaller copy of the table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how long it takes to populate uh, this Eelman store, uh, temp table. And I'm doing it as a temp table just so it doesn't take long to populate the uh, grid. I just want it to take its time doing the calculation and I don't want to take time on this. And it is taking there, but 12 seconds. So 12 seconds to populate almost 8 million rows. And we'll see that it did work. There's my new date. I'm going to go ahead and drop clean buffers to clean out the cache, make sure I'm not cheating. And I'm going to do this again, but this time I'm going to do the EO month function. And what I've found is it is a lot faster. Before it took 12 seconds, this time it took five. So that's pretty good. It took half the time. So I am pretty confident that this EO month function is better than tearing the date apart and putting the date back together. And I'll run this just to show you that it did work, and it did. Okay, so what would happen if I would like to run it on the original big transaction history table that's got 31 million rows? Let's see how that does. Obviously, it's going to take more than five seconds, but let's take a look and see. So we are up to five seconds. I'm hoping it doesn't take any longer than 20. Up to 12 seconds, which is what the original code took to run just the 7 million rows. And it took 19 seconds. I was thinking around 20. So it took 19 seconds to operate on 31 million rows. And it did work. Okay, so um, this is just another example I had uh, where I was doing that concat to show. I'm not going to worry about do it, going through that because I just showed you an earlier one that worked. But I did some timings on some of these just to see. I'm not going to go through all of those. And you can experiment yourself. So if you want to use any of those new easy functions, Make sure you do some testing first to make sure that it, you get the performance that you need. All right. Um, maybe I should stop to see if there's any questions. Simon, can you check to see? Or are we leaving them all to the end? I think, uh, Kathy, there's one. Steve. Of Oscar, he says, do you recommend learning T-SQL on the road towards data science? It's a kind of generic question. Okay, please, please say it again. Do you recommend learning T-SQL on the road toward data science? Yes, definitely, definitely. You, If not T-SQL, SQL in general, uh, because as a data, if you're learning data science, uh, you're not just going to be handed perfect data. 
okay? You may be needing to get data from lots of different systems, all right? And uh, so definitely learn SQL. It doesn't necessarily have to be T-SQL, which is SQL Server's flavor of SQL. Uh, just make sure that you're familiar with at least the SQL language from one vendor. And it's really easy to carry over to others because chances are you'll be pulling data from multiple systems. So that's a fantastic question. And um, what's really cool is I was just recently asked to help. Um, there's a program that I teach you know, in St. Louis and I was just asked to be a guest teacher on some of the analytics and data science sections. So uh, make sure that they get that. So fantastic question. Is that the only question so far? Yeah, yeah, Kathy, you're good to okay. go. Okay, fantastic. So I have feel like I've gone really fast today, but that's fine because I've got extra bonus material if I do uh, need to use it. So the next one, I really love this problem because it represents a couple of cool things for me. First of all, the photo. This is my photo, and this is uh, the beach in the big on the Big Island in Hawaii. And um, I was there with my family, my husband, my children, their spouses, grandchildren. And it was one of my dreams to take the whole family to Hawaii and, and, and to renew our wedding vows on a black sand beach. So we did go to this beach and we got there right as the turtles were coming up out of the ocean and onto the beach. And um, they were, I guess they just come out there to hang out, maybe lay eggs, I don't know. And so we did our wedding ceremony, or kind of just with our family, just a little wedding, wedding vows. And we use, the other dream of mine was used to use the Klingon ceremony without being attacked by the guests, but with the, the vows from Worf and Dax from Deep, Deep Space Nine when they got married and used that ceremony. So I actually got to do this. Uh, the funny thing that happened is my, you know, we've been married 40 years. My granddaughter, who was about five at the time, were walking to the cars and she says, Grandma, are you and Grandpa going to have kids now? So I thought that was hilarious. And she was mad at me when I laughed at her at the time. But now that she's eight, um, when I told her that story, she thought it was pretty funny. So the other milestone that this represents for me is the fact that this island and gaps problem is a very common uh, problem in uh, with data, or with computer science. And it was one of the first problems that I looked at and said, how can I solve this? Will windowing functions help me? And when I started really, really getting used to using windowing functions, they helped me look at things in a set-based manner. And I started just kind of playing with things and looking for patterns. You know, it's not something that I could just, oh yeah, I'm just gonna write this. I had to look at it, think about it, look for patterns, look for ideas. And once I did, I could solve this. And that really, to me, was kind of a breakthrough. And this, you know, back in 2012, there are probably lots of other ways to solve this problem, but I'll show you the way that I came up with. And let's pop over to the code. And this is just some, let's see, I think, let me, I've already ran, created, so I've got the little table. So here's the data. And you can see that I've got consecutive numbers. And this could also be dates. It's just easier, a little less complicated to explain with numbers. If I go to past five, notice that six or seven are missing. That means this is my, this is an island here. Here's another island. Now I'm missing 12. So 13 is an island by itself. 14 is missing. 15, 16, 17 is another island, okay? And go ahead and run that piece. Just show you the data. So I've got 
that's my islands that I'm looking for. So that's the answer. I've got to work towards that, this answer for the islands. So what I like to do is throw a row number into something that's really tricky to solve. Row number has been around since 2005. I was using it since then, not really realizing that it was part of this group of windowing functions. And when I present unwindowing functions, lots of folks have used row number. Usually probably 50 to 75% of the room has used row number and many of them have never really understood that as part of this larger group of windowing functions. So the first thing that I did with this is I just added a row number to try to look for a pattern. So I can see, so row number gives you a unique set of rows over a partition. I don't wanna get into a lot of detail, but I used a partition back in the stock history table to keep the different ticker symbol separate. In this case, I just, I don't have a partition. I would have it right here if I needed it. And so the, the, my partition is the entire set of results. So I've got this unique row number that just counts up. And here's my number, my numbers that I'm working with. Notice that it's equivalent up until number five, they're the same. When I get to my next Let's see, here's my next island. When I get to my next island, they're, all of a sudden they're not matching up. There's a difference of two, a difference of two for every one of these. When I get in my next island, all of a sudden there's a difference of three. In my next island, there's a difference of four. So, hey, that is definitely a pattern. Every island has a different difference between the number and the row number. So my next thing to do, is just go ahead and subtract so I can see that difference. So instead of looking at the row number, now I'm looking at the difference. And I can take advantage of that, that difference and, and group on that and find just the old fashioned min and max, the stuff we've always used to find my islands. So here's the answer. So basically I took that query from the previous, the previous query here, threw it into a common table expression, and then in the outer query, I found the minimum, and the maximum, and I grouped on that difference. I could not write this in one query, okay? I had to separate it somehow. I could have used a temp table or a table variable. I could have used a subquery. In this case, I use a common table expression, but I had to separate that out because I had to work with that row number separately. I could not I, I need that in my grouping here. I can't group on a row number. So I have to separate that out and do that earlier. But that's the answer. And it was really not that difficult. The other side of this problem is the gaps problem. So taking that same data, where are my gaps? So here's my islands. And my first gap is six to seven. My next gap is 12 and my next gap is 14. So what's the, I can just looking that at, I can already see a pattern. The six, it's five plus one. The eight or the seven is eight minus one. So if I take this row and add one to five, I get six, but I have to jump to this other row to do the subtraction. I could, I could start either looking forward or looking back. Hopefully that rings the bell, lag and lead. I can use lag and lead to solve this. What, use one of them, pick one. All right, so how would I do this? I took everything that I worked on before, which was just basically this, in the 
put it in a common table expression, and in an outer query, I use lag. So for the row that I'm working on, I'm subtracting. The row, the previous row, I'm adding. So let's see if this works. And it almost works because I really don't like this row here. I really don't like this. Otherwise, it did work. And I think this is somebody asking me about common table expressions. You can order that. So what I could, what I did here is I went ahead and took that final query, bumped it up to a common table expression, and then in the outer query, checked for null. So I do like common table expressions. I know some people hate them. Again, everything you do in T-SQL, you know, use the right tool to solve the problem. In this case, each item is building on the previous step. Each step builds on the previous step. So common table expressions make sense. Okay. If I um, found that I was hitting a performance problem, I'd back off. I wouldn't use the common table expression. But I do like them just because they're easy to understand what's going on. So I do, I can go ahead and just show you one more thing because I do have another 10 minutes since I started late. Um, intelligent query processing. I know the previous speaker did talk about this a little bit. I'm not going to, this could be a whole hour session. But what I want to talk about is just one feature involved with this. So this is the, if you do a search for intelligent query processing, you'll find this graphic. You'll probably see it in every session about it. And the one I'm going to talk about is this adaptive join batch mode. This is a 2017 feature. Batch mode means that it only works if you're running it on a query that involves a column store index. So I'm hoping that in the future, Microsoft expands this to regular row mode queries. And also, it's also an enterprise edition, which keeps a lot of people from getting the benefit of it. So I'm hoping that Microsoft expands this. Every once in a while, they trickle down some, uh, you know, enterprise level features. So let's take a look at that um, right here. And my execution plans turned on. So I am using an example from Microsoft that I've changed up a little bit, but I found that the original data, it didn't really show, show this. So I had to delete some rows to get this to work. And I'm also putting them, putting this into a, the query from Microsoft into a uh, stored procedure. And inside the stored procedure, I'm passing in this quant variable and then I'm filtering on it. So uh, the other thing about intelligent query processing is you can turn the entire set on or off by changing the compatibility level. Now there's other things you can do. You can turn off a specific feature for a database and you can also turn off a feature for a particular query with a hint. So there's a lot of flexibility. But in this case, I'm just going to turn the feature off by setting the compatibility level back. And I'm also going to free the cache just to make sure we're showing exactly what might go on. Um, so I'm going to call the stored procedure with a value of 360. It returns 206 rows. And when I look at the execution plan, I see that it does a clustered index a clustered index scan, then it does a filter, and then a hash match. Okay, so that is the right plan for that parameter. If I run it with 78, I get back just five rows, 
and I also get back the exact same plan. I'm going to free the cache again and run these in the opposite order. And I'm sure many of you have run across this kind of problem in the past. When I look at the execution plan, it looks very, very different. And now instead of a clustered index scan with a later filter, the predicate it pushed earlier, and I've got a clustered index seek. Also, I've got a nested loop. So what Microsoft is really doing, well, I'm not, let me get to, I'm not done yet. Um, let me run this with 360. And of course, now I'm stuck with the plan for 78. So this is just a classic example of parameter sniffing. So if I change my database compat to 2017, and I should point out that this fact order table is a column store index. All right, so I'm going to free the cache again. And this time, I am going to run against 78. And the plan looks very different. Notice that I have this path and this path. I've got two different paths. However, this one's got zero. And this one shows five rows came through. And I have this thing called an adaptive join. And if you look at the third item in this, and I forgot to turn zoom, turn zoom it on, you'll see that it's actual execution mode, row, actual join type, nested loop. All right, and it's an adaptive join. So what this means is this particular type of join uh, will flip back and forth, and let me show you what happens when I run 360, can flip back and forth depending on how many rows are going to come back in the query. So here it looks the same. However, the, we've got 672 rows on the scan and zero on the seek. And if we look at this uh, on the adaptive join, you'll see that it estimated a nested loop but because of the number of rows that came back, it switched to a hash match. So I really, really hope Microsoft expands on this because this is probably one of the biggest problems people have with queries is data that's you know not necessarily, um, I don't know what, what the word I'm trying to say, but there's a lot of discrepancies in, in different different parameters. Parameter sniffing is the problem. So um, the idea between behind all of these intelligent query processing, except for one, approximate count distinct, except for that one, the idea is that you would not have to change any code to take advantage of these. And I um, have presented on a whole hour on this topic before. And Okay, so I do have, I'll make sure that the slides get to the organizers, and there's quite a few resources for you. And I'd also like to point out that um, Redgate is having uh, a DevOps, free DevOps session over two days next month. So we'd love for you to join us if you're interested in that.